Woof woof my fiente here. Oh wait, um my mic is too loud. Uh testing. Woof woof my fiente here. You guys all know the deal. Let's just get right into it. Hi everyone, my name is Ligon HG, and normally I do hardcore nuzlocks, usually with some type of twist. But in this video, I want to share some ways that you can improve your general nuzlocke skills. One of the most common questions I get asked is some version of, what advice do you have for beginner nuzlockers? And I've wanted to make a video series addressing this question for quite some time, because my favorite thing about my challenge runs is when people tell me that it's inspired them to try a nuzlocke of their own. This video is meant to provide just a few general points that I think can help everyone in any nuzlocke. Okay, yeah, yeah, um... Yeah, sure. But I do have a lot of ideas for videos like this talking about more specific game mechanics. So if you like this video and want more videos where I give Nuzlocke advice and analysis, let me know in the comments. And while you're there, be sure to like the video and subscribe if you want. Okay, let's get started. With Don't subscribe to me though. Subscribe to him. He's way better than me. Is that you can improve your Nuzlocke skills. Number one, Nuzlocke are meant to be fun. Although this isn't necessarily something that will- This is very true. Don't do a Nuzlocke that you're not enjoying. Don't do anything that you're not enjoying, especially when it comes to video games. Video games are meant to be fun. And if you don't like a Nuzlocke, then you can change its rules. You can change the game you're playing. You don't have to Nuzlocke. Like, I've changed some of the rule sets of my Nuzlocke's. Hell, I've even changed some of the Nuzlocke's themselves. I've changed around some of my ROM hacks to make it more um, desirable for me to play. Like, don't feel bad about doing something different in a Nuzlocke, whether that's enabling items or overleveling or whatever. Will directly improve your Nuzlocke skills? I think it's an important point to start with. Don't let Nuzlocke rules ruin your experience with the game, and don't worry too much about them. There is no one right way to do a Nuzlocke, and you should never feel pressured to do the hardest possible version of a Nuzlocke, no matter what some condescending idiots on the internet say. Especially when you're just starting out, it's okay to play loose with the rules. Be honest, but have fun. If it's your first Nuzlocke and you lost your starter in Victory Road, who cares? Give yourself a mulligan and just finish the game. Next time, try again with no mulligans if you want. Nuzlocke are meant to be what you want them to be, so make sure that they're above all else, fun. And when they're not, change the rules, take a break, or try a different challenge. Number two, don't overthink things. This is yeah, this is also very true. Um, though. Depending on the challenge, for instance, I'm doing a challenge where I can't use any wild Pokemon and I can never get more than five encounters in any given run of Pokemon X. So I have to really think about every fight. And if I can't guarantee a fight deathless, I try to go as far as close as I can to guaranteeing that fight deathless. But most of the time, if you're doing like a regular hardcore Nuzlocke, you're going to have an extra encounter in the box. You're going to have like 20 extra encounters in the map. So... It's sometimes better to just go in, go for a fun strategy that works instead of a boring and instead of instead of wasting eight hours trying to think of a strategy that's guaranteed to work, which you probably won't even find because a lot of battles have so much randomness that you won't find a strategy that's 100% guaranteed to work. Spend maybe 10 to 30 minutes theory crafting if it's like a vanilla game, I would say, if you need that. And just go in with whatever you think is fun and whatever you think will work. And usually it'll work out all right. And if it doesn't work out all right, then you will probably have backups. So it's fine. This is probably the most important lesson, as it can be applied to so many facets of the game. Sometimes the easiest play is the best play. There's no need to come up with a complex play if spamming surf from your powerful water type is the best play possible. Although in-depth game knowledge is incredibly helpful, it can also be a crux if you overthink things. Yes, you are a special and very smart individual for knowing what nature's EVs and IVs are. But in about 90% of Nuzlocke's, nature's EVs and IVs really don't matter all that much. Especially nature's. Stop letting the nature of your Pokemon dictate its role on your team. Nature's only impact is at by 10%. So an adamant Kadabra is still an incredibly powerful special sweeper, and a quiet Crobat is still insanely fast. The best example of this is with Eevee, since it can evolve into a range of different Pokemon each with their own roles on a team. In my most recent playthrough of Ultra Sun, I got an adamant Eevee, and people damn near lost their minds when I evolved it into a Vaporeon. But it's adamant. That's minus attack. Why didn't you evolve it into a Flareon? Well, because Flareon kind of sucks. And I also already had a strong fire type in Houndoom. In the moment, what my team desperately needed was a bulky water type with water absorbed. In general, especially during Nuzlocke without any added rules like monotype challenges, don't overthink things. Number three, always minimize RNG. This is true. This goes kind of against the oh, never overthink things part. Um, again, if you are if you are willing to put that extra ten to thirty minutes into theory crafting, you don't have to over, you don't have to think for eight hours about every single Pokemon and every single move. But if you put a little bit of time into theory crafting, say, oh, if a, if a crit happens, I'll die, or oh, if I use this move, then the AI will do this, that can save a lot of deaths. RNG is a staple in any competitive game like Pokemon, and it's impossible to completely avoid it. But the best Nuzlockers will optimize their playstyle to reduce the chance of unfortunate RNG. The most common and frustrating types of RNG are when your opponent gets a critical hit, when your opponent procs a secondary effect from a move such as an Omni Boost from Agent Power or Paralysis from Body Slam, and when you miss a move, either due to low accuracy or some sort of status condition like confusion or paralysis. There's a lot of ways to minimize RNG, but one of the most important things to keep in mind is that the longer the battle is, the more likely you are to get screwed by RNG, statistically speaking. So if you can finish a battle in four turns instead of five turns, that's one less turn that your opponent has the chance to get a critical hit. Get in, get out. The other way to minimize RNG is to avoid using moves that are not 100% accurate as often as possible, even if it means sacrificing some power. Even with a 95% accurate move, over the course of an entire run where you're using that move multiple, multiple times, you will miss, probably more than once. That's just how probability works. So while moves like Hydro Pump, Fire Blast, Blizzard, and Thunder are enticing for their insane power, it's best to just avoid them unless you absolutely have to use them as some sort of Hail Mary. It's better to right. There are some moves, though. There are some cases where, say, you'll only have a 50% chance to kill with Flamethrower, but a 100% chance to kill with Fire Blast. And sometimes the chance to just knock something out outright is really useful.
especially if you do have the bulk to, say, survive a crit or survive a few misses. Um, low accuracy moves with recovery can help because if you get that move on the first try, then it's really good. And oftentimes, depending on your setups and depending on your Pokemon, if you do miss those moves, then if you build your team right, you should be able to recover from that, sometimes literally recover. So I wouldn't say abandon moves like Fire Blast and Hydro Pump immediately, but they are not usually recommended, especially with their low power points. Ready to just use Surf, Flamethrower, Ice Beam, or Thunderbolt. Same goes for moves like Will-O-Wisp, Sleep Powder, Hypnosis, and Screech. They're useful moves to have for sure, but you never want to find yourself risking an entire run on hitting a 75% accurate sleep power. Number four, always think about pivoting. Although this is very true. Um, a lot of people just go in with their one Pokemon and try to sweep, and if they run into something that has a super effective move against it, that thing's going to die. Uh, don't do that. D make make sure to think about, even though you're losing a turn, it's not it's not the end of the world, and usually it's better defensively. I used to always think that switching was a waste, but it's really not. If you have a water type against a grass type, switch into a fire type. Well, this doesn't matter nearly as much if you're playing on switch mode. Pivoting is incredibly useful and not always the easiest thing to remember. Pivoting refers to using one Pokemon solely to bait a move from your opponent so that you can get another Pokemon in safely. For example... Oh yeah, that's another thing that I that I forgot about. Um, pivoting basically allows you to use Pokemon... Well, he'll explain it, but it basically allows you to switch into matchups more defensively and often it can save you especially if you only have some of your pokemon as main attackers if you have um, pivots that are more tanky you can use those to have a higher advantage when you do end up going in well, in Ultra Sun, the totem Komoo knows Dragon Claw, Drain Punch, Thunder Punch, and Poison Jab. I want to start with Gyarados to get an attack drop with Intimidate. Since Gyarados is times 4 weak to Thunder Punch, that's what the Komoo is going to go for. Ultimately, I want to bring out my Carving, but if I switch straight to Carving from Gyarados, a Thunder Punch might paralyze him, which would be really bad. Instead, I can switch to Gastrodon, who is immune to Thunder Punch, and then I can switch to Carving, who happens to be immune to Komoo's Dragon Claw. Gastrodon didn't actually do any damage to Komoo, but she was invaluable to getting Carving in safely. I have a lot more that I can say about examples of pivoting cores and how to build a team that gives you the best pivoting strategies, but I think I'll save that for another video if people seem interested. For now, it's enough to just say that you should always be thinking about how your Pokemon's resistances, and more importantly, their immunities, can be used for easy pivoting. Number five, use all your Pokemon. Yes, this is very true, both in terms of using an entire team of six and in terms of using all the encounters that you have. Oftentimes, especially if you have a very large box, it's very easy to overlook something. And so sometimes if you consider all your options, like, like I said earlier, if you take 10 minutes or 30 minutes or however long it takes, depending on how far in the game you are and all that, consider all your options and there's going to be something that you probably missed the first time and something that's going to be really helpful, and it could save your run. In regular playthroughs of For instance, in Pokemon Emerald, I never really thought about this until I looked through all the encounters, but Starmie is pretty much a guarantee to kill Kingdra if it has a certain moveset, it, and it's really useful for that, for Juan's gym. The Pokemon game. It's pretty common to pick six Pokemon for your team and use them for every battle in the game. That's how I play, at least. But you don't have to do that. You don't need to just use the same six Pokemon in every fight. Specifically optimize your team for the challenge ahead. If you're about to fight a fire type gym leader, leave your grass type in the box and bring a second water type. If you're fighting a team with strong physical attackers, bring two Pokemon with Intimidate. It might take a little bit to train up your Pokemon to the right level, but it's worth it. Alternatively, you can plan to bring a Pokemon that you can sacrifice if you find yourself in a bind. Sacrificing a Pokemon that's normally sitting in the box might give you the extra turn you need to get a safe switch or heal up one of your Pokemon that's waiting in the back. As much as it hurts, the best Nuzlockers know when to make a smart sacrifice. So be sure to use all your resources and don't be afraid to customize your team of six for each major challenge. Lastly, number six, practice makes perfect. This, this is very true, but also practice makes permanent. Don't make the same misplays over and over again. A lot of people will do the same thing wrong multiple times. I am in fact guilty of it. Um, I need to focus a lot more and I tend to not be good at focusing. So practice is very difficult. So don't feel bad if you keep doing the same th thing wrong over and over again. Learning from your mistakes is just as difficult as not making those mistakes in the first place. This last tip is one that can be applied to basically anything that you're trying to get better at. If you aren't immediately good at nuzlocking, that's okay. Nuzlocks are hard, and it takes time to figure out how to crack them. But like any video game or sport or hobby, the more you do it, the better you'll be. I've been playing Pokemon games for over 20 years, and I've been nuzlocking for about a decade. But I didn't beat the first nuzlock I ever tried. No, my hero died to a self-destruct coughing in Silico, and I got so upset that I turned off the game and pretended that it never happened. That's a failure. But I learned from that failure to always be wary of coughing and wheezing. And eventually, after a few more failed attempts, I finally completed a nuzlock. And then after that, I never made a single mistake for the rest of my long story career as a nuzlocker. But of course, not everyone can be me. So to add an addendum to this final tip, it's important to remember that nobody is perfect, no matter how much you practice, except for me. You will make mistakes because humans are stupid. I mean, look around you. So just remember to not kick yourself too hard when you make a mistake. The best Nuzlockers learn from their mistakes and try oh, to how they can that's a the mouth. Same again. And that's so his mustache. Six tips or pieces of advice or whatever that will hopefully help you improve your skills as a Nuzlocker. Whether it's your first. Yes, this is my favorite part of X and Y. I've said it multiple times and I'll say it over and over again. Nuzlocke or your 100th Nuzlocke, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you did, like the video and subscribe if you want. And if there's other things that you'd like me to cover in future videos, let me know down in the comments. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos. And until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit. All right, that's it. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, bye.